Thank you very, very much. My uh, prospective apologies to the translator. You may be from Australia, but I'm from New York, which means that we talk twice as fast. I will do my best. Uh, I, the, gladly, I can't see the translators, which means uh, I cannot see their angry faces. So my apologies. Uh, so no Mark Zuckerberg, you're right. But uh, I want to talk and start for a moment with another big tech company, namely that of Amazon. Many of you may have heard uh, that Amazon is trying to pick a second headquarters, right? They have their headquarters uh, out on the West Coast, and they are now holding out, they're dangling the golden carrot of a second headquarters that they will build in the United States. And with it comes the prospect of 50,000 jobs, 50,000 tech jobs that will come with it. So as a result, and a process that goes on all the time in countries all around the world, but that we don't typically see, we're being treated in the press to more openness about this process than we've ever seen before. And namely, in this case, the process by which mayors and government leaders are falling all over themselves to see how much money they can give away to Amazon in return for this great new sighting of their headquarters, right? So the state of New Jersey, for example, has said, we will give you $7 billion in tax breaks if you come to us. Or another city in California, which is not on the short list, they lost, said, we will not just give you money, we will give you control over the whole city. You can run it for us. That's what we'll give you back. So this is not an entirely new idea, right? A decade ago, in the city of Chicago, there was a great need for cash and for money. And so what they did was said, we will give over the rights to collect the parking tickets, the fees from the parking tickets and parking meters to a private company in exchange for a lump sum of cash that they needed at the time. It's been estimated that the city lost a billion dollars as a result of this deal. And now, if you've read the latest issue of Wired Magazine, you'll see about the deal that is being done between Google and the city of Toronto in Canada, the deal with uh, the Alphabet spin-off, which is called Sidewalk Labs, which would again give the company, in this case, authority to develop a very large portion of the city, 12 acres, called the Quayside portion of the city. But it's not clear what the city will get back in return. It's not clear what will happen to the data that's collected, and I know that the new data privacy regulation has just been passed here in Europe, and now every time I open a website, I'm getting asked permissions, thank God. I don't know what will happen when my computer goes back to the US, business as usual. But it's not clear what will happen to the data that the company is actually collecting. So it's, these are just a couple of examples about the ways in which communities today are grappling with some of the challenges, especially challenges faced with the governance of new technologies. So whether it's going to be autonomous vehicles or next generation gene editing or smart city technologies, cities on the one hand and states and national legislatures and governments have the responsibility to act as a good steward to take care of the public trust and the public taxpayer dollar, but don't have a lot of understanding about these and many other complex issues. And tech regulation is just one example. We can take terrorism or climate change or anything else in between. We're facing incredibly complex issues, and we need better ways to address the challenges that we're facing. Right? And those challenges are going to include questions of ethics and of safety, you know, do we let the autonomous vehicle kill the grandmother or kill the five school children are the questions that are now getting debated. But there are questions also of revenue generation and tax policy and how we're going to recoup the revenue as our infrastructure changes. What happens to the future of jobs and job losses as, again, technology uh, creates dislocation in some sectors and autonomy and uh, innovation in others. What's going to happen with these questions of data gathering and transparency? Who will decide what data should be open and what data we should all have access to? And then there are the countless jurisdictional debates. Who's going to decide? Mul UN organizations and multinational organizations, national level, local level, or something else? All of the issues that we face, and especially those we confront using new technology, Creating are creating today tremendous pressures and 
challenges for governance. Now, there's a whole new school of thought which says that we need to go about regulating new issues in a different way than we've done before. Not top-down with command and control style regulation, but using what my friends at Nesta call anticipatory regulation. And you can take a look at the work that Nesta does, or Dark Matter Labs, or other folks who are writing about the need to create regulatory systems that are more evolutionary, that are more decentralized, that are more iterative, in other words, a process by which we place less burden on new technologies and on the companies that create them, and at the same time create greater protections for consumers and for citizens because we're more evolutionary and more flexible in our approaches. But to do this, to affect this kind of change, to have what we might call green lights instead of red lights in terms of our regulation, helping to promote innovation rather than to stop it, is we need governance processes that are going to be more inclusive. At the very least, we need people who are more tech savvy, who are more scientifically savvy, who have expertise of different kinds to help us respond to our challenges, be at the table, so to speak, to be participating in the conversations about how we respond to today's challenges. And that means that we need to use these very same technologies, not to regulate, it's not just the regulation of the technology, it's using the technologies to change how we regulate, to transform democracy and to transform policy making and decision making in order to allow us all to participate in new ways so that we can legislate not only more legitimately, but also more effectively. So what I'm here to talk about today is what I see as being the next generation beyond e-governance in what we might call e-participation. It's both something we've been doing for a long time and I think something that's profoundly changing and will change in the next few years in order to enable us to confront the challenges that we're facing. What we're doing now in terms of largely closed, largely top-down systems, I would put to you is not working. It's not working as well as it ought to, it's not as agile as it need to be, and it's not allowing us to get the expertise and innovation and data that we need to make decisions more effectively. But the growing field of digital democracy is becoming more sophisticated, surely more sophisticated than it used to be. When I started working for the Obama White House in 2009, this was my desktop. In case you can't read, that says Windows 2000. It has been slightly upgraded since then, but uh, I'm not sure by very much. Right, there is this feeling that we are behind when it comes to government in terms of how we use technology. Maybe not in Estonia, but surely everywhere else which is why all of you and I are here today coming to the Mecca, to the digital republic, to learn how we can get more tech savvy and how we work. But even with the best tools, even with plenty of technology, the process of engaging with people is still very difficult. It's not something that we've known how to do very well, even when we have the tools. So when I first started working for President Obama now a long time ago, I had this great idea that we would, instead of setting the president's policy for the first 100 days, as you do after the election and before the inauguration, it's called the transition period, instead of our deciding what those policies would be, we would ask the American public what, in fact, they thought the White House should work on in the beginning of the administration. And so we did, we asked people, and not surprisingly, they responded. We got, in fact, 84,000 comments, 84,000 comments in the space of about three weeks. And you know what happened to those comments? What happened to those comments? Nobody read them, of course not. Who can read 84,000 comments? What a terrible idea to do such a thing. I mean, they made a nice photo op. Here's the photographer, right? There, here's the book. We printed all the paper. We handed it to the president. Look, the people said. But nobody read any of this stuff because we weren't set up to be able to do so. Now, there have been examples, good examples, of uses of offline and online mechanisms for many years now to engage with people. 
Right, and it's here in Estonia, there has been example of what uh, is sometimes called the Fishkin method, the use of deliberative polling, in other words, choosing a random sample of citizens to discuss policy ideas. But there's two challenges with this as a general rule. One is it's very, very small. And two, two is it's very expensive. And three is it doesn't have much impact on actual decision making. The Fishkin method was set up as a social science research tool to measure how people change their mind. If I talk to you, my neighbor, it's going to change my opinion and we can see how my opinion changes. It was never designed to be a tool for making policy in more effective ways. The Jefferson Center out of Missouri has been for a long time running something called the Citizen Jury, used extensively in Denmark to debate science policy, especially things like GMO policy. Again, very small representative samples of citizens to help build legitimacy in terms of policy making, but not necessarily greater effectiveness. Some experimentation now, especially after the rather failed GMO policy making by the European Commission a few years ago, to say we can't do this behind closed doors anymore. We actually have to engage with people. We have to experiment with the idea of crowdsourcing or engaging with wider numbers of people to actually think about how we craft our policy. And there are examples now of using online tools to get people to do more than simply share their ideas or opinions, but to actually get people to work together. So in Mexico, they've, this was a short project that this lab for Mexico City did, was to get volunteers to work together to create a map of the unofficial van system in Mexico City. They already had a, uh, an app for the subways and for the buses, but nothing for the informal transportation mechanisms. So they crowdsourced it and of course people responded and they built the map very quickly. The next sort of wave of this that we see in 1,500 communities around the world is the, of course, the experiment of participatory budgeting. In South Australia, just to remind you of home, uh, is the 40 million Australian dollars being spent using participatory budgeting by citizens, not only volunteering ideas, but in this case, actually making the decisions about how money will be spent. And in Mexico, in the Desafios project in Monterrey, one of the wealthy cities in Mexico, uh, there has been an effort to take this even to the next level, which is to get citizens working together with civil servants to not only decide, but actually to implement new projects and policies. In this case, most recently, a process for reducing the time that children and that uh, civil servants spend commuting between uh, home and school and cutting that amount of time in half. Uh, oops, there's another one from this one. So we're seeing a kind of evolution or trend f uh, toward the use of new technologies for more and more robust forms of engagement. That forms of engagement, I would put to you, is becoming and needs to become more institutionalized in processes that I would call or nickname crowd law. In other words, it's not simply civil society getting together to debate or to discuss, but to actually change the way our institutions work. And to do so by thinking very distinctly about the information that's needed at every stage of the policy or lawmaking process. So it's happening in lots of ways, right? Brazil now has a new platform called Mudamos where 650,000 people have signed up more than the population of all of Tallinn, have signed up to actually be able to propose legislation to the national parliament. And the more that we do this and we think about this, I would put to you, the more effective we will become at responding to the challenges of our age. But we have to think distinctly in terms of phases. And what I want to do is to just give you a couple of examples, one from each stage of the process of what's happening around the world and where it might go. So obviously the first stage of every or any policy making process is that of setting the agenda, identifying the problems that we're actually going to work on. And you may know that at the, the, the example and have heard from the folks from Taiwan, Audrey Tang, very well known CTO of Taiwan, who spearheaded the V-Taiwan process, a process now to help policymakers get diverse forms of expertise from the public using this experimental um, 
engagement platform that anyone can participate in. It's not a single tool or a single process or a single kind of platform. It's really an amalgamation, a combination of a lot of different tools that they've put together uh, in order to enable participants to both suggest problems and also respond with solutions. And let me say that what's, I think, important to note with all of these is that very often they put together problem identification, solution identification, implementation in ways that often muddle, muddle the process and cause some challenges. But VTaiwan is a very, very hopeful process. They use a combination of offline and online processes. They use artificial intelligence software called Polis, P-O-L dot I-S, machine learning software that helps sort the comments that they get so that when you get 84,000 comments, you can actually make sense of them and group them in more meaningful ways. It allows citizens to create working groups uh, with civic groups and businesses and government leaders who are brought together again to discuss problems and then work out solutions. And in the case of VTaiwan, more than 80% of the projects, of the cases of consultations that have gone through this process have actually led to government action, and to government action that has been very much driven by solutions created by citizens. It's an entirely open community in that anybody who shows up is part of the community, whether or not you live in Taiwan. So right now you may not be allowed to be on Facebook, but you can go on to VTaiwan if you like and participate in an online consultation. And it's a wholly volunteer process and project which allows for this kind of direct citizen engagement. 200,000 people have participated. But again, there are limitations here because anyone can participate does not mean everyone can participate. And there's also the challenge, again, that in this case, uh, the process of identifying problems, something which should and could be done with large numbers of citizens, is often circumscribed to a very small number of civic technologists who are capable of participating in the whole process as it's currently laid out. There are new, there is another kind of generation, though, of tools that we're seeing that are not about helping institutions identify problems from people, from collective intelligence, using uh, communications tools, but more about using artificial intelligence and big data to help mine social media and other sources of data to identify the problems that people care about. So you may have seen this Erasmus experimental pilot, which is a social media mining platform for European policymakers to help them understand what is it that young people care about and are talking about. So even without creating a complex consultation process, they have been able to train an AI algorithm to filter out relevant algorithms that are connected to subjects of youth concern, like youth mobility and youth jobs that are making it easier to listen to and set the agenda based on what people actually care about. Now this is and needs to be distinct from the process of identifying solutions. And in the case, in a project that many people in the room will be quite familiar with, a project that started in Iceland and migrated here, of course, to Estonia, there is this, next, there is this better Reykjavik project. It too combines identifying problems with identifying solutions. So this project that you may know of, which grew out of the banking crisis and the loss of trust that happened in 2008, was a way to harness the creativity and innovation of broader society to come up with ideas through idea generation and what they call policy crowdsourcing to improve the delivery of services and the operations of the city of Reykjavik. We can make all those services digital, but we still need ways to hear back from people what it is that they actually care about. In Iceland, 20% of the population has, is actually registered on the site, and half of them use the site regularly, and now it's in use in 20 countries. And as many people in the room are already familiar with, but I give this for the benefit of the non-Estonians in the room, in 2012, there was an experiment run, the Ravoku experiment, to bring this process to Estonia, and to actually then, in that, in that case, also offer a platform 
uh, within a three-week period that 60,000 people took part in to come up with ideas for amending Estonia's laws on political parties and political financing. Uh, as a result of that process, three of the initiatives that were proposed have actually been implemented into law, four of which have been partly adopted as policies, and has led, more importantly now, to an ongoing process of citizen consultation and citizen proposals that have been used, that are that it's still in place today. However, the process also uses uh, artificial intelligence. This active citizens or better Reykjavik platform uses artificial intelligence, again, uses machine learning to identify whether proposals conform to regulations, to send notifications to people on relevant issues, to give users recommendations of content. In other words, using artificial intelligence to make the collective intelligence more meaningful. But let me breeze through the last couple of phases. There is, of course, the next stage, which is one that's more difficult and where consultation is not as frequently used, and that is the process of actually drafting. So we've identified the problem, we've come up with a number of solutions, but then we actually need to write something. And that's a process where, again, it's typically done behind closed doors, because it requires a higher level of commitment to the process, potentially some legal knowledge or knowledge of technical processes, but in which it has been possible in a variety of places, including Brazil and in France and in Morocco, to engage people in crafting the draft itself as a way to introduce new ideas into the process, as a way to build better legitimacy to the process. But if it's done poorly, as Tariq Nesh Nash will tell you about Legislation Lab in Morocco, if you simply set it up to say, what do you think of the draft, people will tell you what they think of the draft, such as telling you, this is crap, this sucks, and all the useful comments we tend to get on listservs and discussion boards that are entirely unhelpful. So they have to be designed well, they have to be designed in a way to get at people's concerns, but in a manageable and meaningful way, using constraints in the design to actually get people to participate successfully as they did in the case of Brazil. Implementation is equally hard. How do we translate a grand principle or an idea, a solution, into actual practice? Well, MindLab has been doing this for the last 16 years in Denmark, using a combination of human-centered design of actual ethnographic research and engagement with people to identify how do we actually turn ideas into actual practices. MindLab has been so successful, and I say this somewhat counterintuitively, they've been so successful they've put themselves out of business this year. That is to say, what started as a little initiative over here, a kind of innovation lab for the government of Denmark and the first public lab of its kind, has become standard practice for the government and for a variety of reasons now has become the way in which everybody knows to work. That is to engage with citizens, with stakeholders, with businesses on developing the implementation strategies for the policies that get developed. Finally is the last and I think least appreciated phase and the one where we will see the most growth, and that is the phase of assessment or evaluation. Right now we tend to make policy or we tend to make laws and then we tend to hope that they work. And we wait until elections when people criticize the failings of those laws and policies by changing who's in office. That's the process we typically use for evaluating whether things work or not. But there are places like Ghana where the TransGov platform is used to engage in what some people call social auditing. That is to say, to get citizens involved, much the same way that citizen science does, in actually evaluating what, in fact, is working. Is the policy we've set up, such as the law passed in Brazil to guarantee children a healthy school lunch, and then asking children to take pictures of their lunch and send them back to determine, is it actually working? Or in a simpler way, in Chile, in the Senate, they have a concept called Evaluación de la Ley. We're actually going to evaluate the law by having a facilitation process where people sit together around a table to determine if the law is actually working or not. 
Now, all of these crowd law processes are emerging. Everything I've shown you is something that's happened really just in the last two years. This is very new stuff. The idea of citizen consultation is old. The use of technology is, is, is not all that new. But the formal uses of these processes are really very, very new. And we have very little understanding of what works or not at these, each of these different phases. How are individuals affected? How is society affected? How are these institutional processes actually affected? In Madrid, I can tell you where they have a platform called Decide. Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sort of nerdy at heart. It's amazing I haven't fallen off the stage yet. Uh, they have a platform called Decide. They have 200, 400,000 people, excuse me, registered on the platform currently. Let's hope I get the number right. 20,000 proposals that have actually been made to the city council to change how they, you know, to propose a law, to change how they do things. Fantastic new participatory idea. How well do you think it works? How many of those 20,000 proposals have actually become new laws? 800? You are, thank you for guessing that and making me look good. Incorrect! Guess again. <laughs> 20, he's, he, you're, I, I could have paid you. The answer, of course, is zero. <laughs> two of them have, I heard the two, two have moved forward to the next stage of consideration, but actually zero have actually led to anything or becoming, have become a law. And so Madrid has correctly said, what's not working here? We have this fabulous direct participatory mechanism in a day in which you know, people are clamoring for more impact, more ability to have influence on political processes. Why is it not actually working? Well, the policies are very, uh, don't take a picture of this. Uh, the policy, here's my, here, what's my face here. Uh, the policies are of great interest to people. The number one proposal is about dog poop. There's a lot of proposals about dog poop in Madrid. So that's the number one data point. But they're not working. We're not getting new laws on, do on dog poop. And the question is, why not? Well, Madrid has rightly said, we don't know. Now, if you went to this website right now and you looked at it, you would say, oh, I know what's wrong with it. This button should be here and this should be there, and I'm smarter about how to design it. But they've correctly said, we don't understand and we don't want to guess as to why the proposals aren't getting signatures. So we're going to start a process of experimentation this summer to actually test what's not working. So in the same way that right now you're on Amazon or Facebook or Google or whatever you're on and you are being experimented on, right? You see one shade of blue link and you see another shade of blue link and for you the button is in a different place than it is for me because they're experimenting on us to sell us more advertising and products. We can do some of this experimentation with these platforms to understand how we can actually make these processes better than they are today. I've written a little bit in Nature about this idea of more experimentation in the wild, more uncontrolled experiments, if you will, that we have to do to understand why and how these processes can be made more effective. We need mixed method research, qualitative research, quantitative research, randomized control trials as they're going to do in Madrid by dividing the people on the website into different groups, showing them different messages, seeing what influences people to participate, again, with their knowledge and with their consent, I might add, in experiments that are fully transparent, to understand how we can actually make these processes work better than they do today. Some of them are really, really good for suggesting ideas, for suggesting problems, but they fall apart when it comes to designing solutions. And they're surely not very good at designing complex implementation processes, and even worse at actually evaluating what happens. 
So what I would put to you is that we need more experimentation in this space, more people in government to be trying more crowd law processes, more online engagement, but also more research, collaboration with local and international universities, with tech companies and others, to really figure out and how to do research. It's often called this pastor's kind of research. It will advance our knowledge about the state of engagement, but it will also at the same time hopefully advance the cause of democracy and enable us to solve real problems, to design better approaches to autonomous vehicles, reduce the traffic that we have in our streets, respond to climate change, and really solve hard problems in new ways. So with that, I want to wrap up and simply say that we are, thanks to the availability of new technologies, on the cusp of potentially new forms of and reinvigorated forms of, dem of democracy in ways that we have not seen before. We have the ability to create new forms of direct democracy, where people with the push of a button can actually vote on things that they have never been able to vote on before, not once a year, but more frequently. So we have to ask ourselves, is that a good thing? And when is it a good thing? There are new ways to engage in deliberation, for us to talk to one another, to our neighbors, to other stakeholders, not simply based on geography, but all around the world, to engage in conversations that can, again, help us to explore innovative solutions to hard problems. We can engage in what I would call more collaborative democracy, actually engagement across sectors that allow us to work together to develop solutions even to hard problems, not by simply pushing a button and saying yes, no, or I hate your comment, or that sucks, but actually to sit down and do the hard work mediated by the technologies of collective intelligence and artificial intelligence to develop solutions to our hardest problems. Collective intelligence will play a role, artificial intelligence will play a role in helping to make these processes manageable and meaningful in ways that we have never been able to do before. And let me say that I think we have to do this. Annual elections, biannual, semi-annual, every four years, it's not enough to safeguard our democracy. There are countless critics today, and I think we all feel the sense, wherever we live, that liberal democracy may be somewhat in danger. And surely where I come from, we are concerned that, we, that liberal democracy is under assault economic dislocation, the power of social media, the rise of populist leaders in so many places, the election of people who lack respect for basic constitutional values and the rule of law, are, need to cause us to question the safety of our democracy. And surely if you're in a place like Estonia, where we're celebrating 100 years of Estonian independence, but the country was founded in 1918, and it was independent for exactly one day before it then was taken over by a series of occupiers and was only recently, for 25 years, has really only recently been an independent democracy. Perhaps no better way, place than here to acknowledge the fragility of these political systems and to recognize that we have to do more. We have to build our own version of the Baltic chain. In 1989, you remember how two million people from Latvia and Lithuania and Estonia held hands and showed the world that freedom and independence were possible and that people were demanding it. We now need our virtual Baltic chain. We now need to create the bulwark, the institutions, the platforms and the processes that allow all of us to participate in, the, in our institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. Does anybody have any questions? While well, Beth still has a few moments up there on the stage, you put your hand up questions, and we'll come over comments, to you. Questions, comments, Lovely, we have a gentleman over here. Where is my help? We'll get into the microphone. We'll speak into the microphone. Go around the back. Uh, we'll speak into the microphone so the uh, translators can hear the question too. Yes, hello, uh, my name is Jeremy Miller from Denmark. <laughs> uh, not working in the mind lab, but I have been working with them. Uh, great uh, presentation. One quick question. Yes. Uh, I know that all this e-democracy is hard for governments. It's even harder for citizens, ordinary people, I think. 
I mean, many people react in relation to their own mindsets, their own prejudices, you might say, the problems they see in their everyday life, which may be quite unique. They're not very good at reacting to the evidence about what works and what does not work. So how do we educate? How do we train? How do we help citizens, ordinary people, to actually learn at the same time as governments are learning? Oh. I think that's, you know, because we get the, you know, you talked about digital elites, we get those. We get the not in my backyard problem, you know, where people say, we don't want that gas work, they don't want that uh, sewage works here, mm -hmm. but we want something nice here. But it's got to be somewhere, right? How do we do that? Do you, any, any answers? Any <laughs> suggestions? <laughs> how, how long do we have now? Uh, so that is a great question for discussion over lunch, let me say, uh, since I think that that's requires some depth. Let me, let me answer that. Um, uh, you know, I'm a lawyer, so we love to say it depends and give evasive answers, but let me try to do somewhat better than that. On the, so let me say it first. It is a, you're asking in many ways the most important question. And when we created new democratic institutions of a traditional sort, we then invested huge amounts of resources across media, across schools, in terms of legal frameworks, uh, in creating and building civic culture in order to support those fledgling institutions. I think it's not different now. There is not a, there's no simple answer to this where I could say 42 or you'll build a civic video game and all kids will suddenly learn how to be good citizens. It is a process of acculturation that we need to be engaged in across the platforms, across schools, across institutions, something that we need to do a lot of work to do. However, that said, on a more specific uh, thing we can do. So taking a page from MindLab, one thing we can do is engage in participatory to design. So many of these platforms are built by civic technologists, very enthusiastic, passionate people who get and understand and want to create more democratic engagement using these platforms, but often without talking to the bus driver, the taxi driver, the house husband, the parent, the school teacher, you know, people who may not be tech enthusiasts, but who are citizens, who are members of the public, may not even be citizens, but who have the opportunity uh, and, and need to engage in these processes. The second thing, so we need to actually engage people in the design of these tools. Second, we need to actually test them with real people to, in fact, see what works. That's why I'm very excited about this project in Madrid, which is the first of its kind. Madrid is based on an open source engagement framework called Consul. Consul is used in 60 cities. In none of those cities has be there been a process of actually testing the platforms with people to get their feedback and input on how they want to participate and what actually works for them. The third, though, is to actually design processes that solicit and elicit the information that people want. So I'll, let me stop with this. I designed a platform in a very different area 10 plus years ago called Peer to Patent. It was a platform designed to help volunteer scientists and technologists participate in the process of deciding patent applications. Not to make the ultimate decision, but to supply information to the patent office. If we had simply said, tell us how you feel about this patent, people would have told us how they feel about this patent. In those days, you know, it was, the, it, was, it was back in the old days when Microsoft was the bad guy and the open, remember, my, everything Microsoft did was evil because they weren't open source. We've come a very long way. Um, but you would have gotten a lot of Microsoft is evil comments. That's all we would have gotten. But instead, we created a process which said, well, the, here is the information we need from you. We need this data, these kind of facts, this sort of evidence. Otherwise, you can't participate. So you know what? We didn't get a lot of people. We got a small numbers and then growing numbers of people because the platform did some of the work of teaching people how to participate in ways that were meaningful and manageable. And I think that's some of what we can do is to actually have a process of not only asking people, but engaging in conversation and education through the use of the platforms themselves, through feedback from the institutions, either digitally or otherwise, that says this feedback was or wasn't helpful. People participate because they want it to matter. They want it to be relevant. And so we owe them the feedback to tell them whether it was relevant or not in order to affect exactly, I think, that kind of educational process. 
Uh, just time for one more question, I think down here, sir. Um, hi, Gareth McNaughton, RMIT in Barcelona. One of the things that I'm challenged by is the direct democracy. We're used to representative democracy, a level of confidence that we outsource to representatives of the people that we elect to act for us in our interest for four years. Most people don't want to be engaged. Now, that's the, I, I love IT, I worked in HP, Cisco, I worked at the Commission. But I, I, after many years of working in it, Consul in Madrid is because there's 800 members of the Parti Popular who have been judged and condemned for corruption. It's exploding all over our newspapers. That's why Consul's there. There's a cultural social context. In Sweden, they won't have the same background to that but they'll still want to be engaged. So my concern is that, are you saying direct democracy and more engagement will solve all of our cultural, social, historical issues? Is it going to be the answer? Or are we going to see different things emerging in different countries? So it's a, uh, so a fabulous question. Uh, and I would, and let me make very clear that to me, direct democracy is, uh, what is the opposite of the answer? Prob is, is short, of <laughs> short of the kind of corruption and venality to which some of this was a response, it's the worst possible solution. I am deeply afraid that the way that we are designing these systems, in other words, the preference for these push button systems, or even worse, my dear friend Cesar Hidalgo at MIT has said not only should we have these push button systems, but we should get rid of human beings. We will train a bot to know your preferences and to vote for you on everything. So we will have artificial direct democracy. Uh, he gave a TED talk about this. I think this is a nightmare of a scenario. For the but what I mean by putting up this list here is to say that you can love technology all you want. It doesn't substitute for a very hard conversation about what is the future that we actually want. And you are right that in the Spanish context, there are a lot of reasons why the public wants to have some ability to influence the political agenda in a way that has not been possible to date. And the context there is very different than it would be somewhere else. But the truth is, everywhere, when it comes to the making of hard policies, we need to build a public housing system, we need to decide which way the traffic should go. These are not things that we can or should vote on by the push of a button. We can also do that at the end of the process, but we need to be engaged in much more thoughtful ways that actually tap into our ability and our expertise to develop innovative and effective and workable solutions. What's so exciting to me about Desafios in Mexico or um, uh, Revolución CR in Costa Rica, which was one of the slides, or even the V Taiwan process, is that these are designed to get at hard and difficult thinking from real people, but who have knowledge to share about how to do things better and differently and to solve problems. No one of these processes by themselves is the answer. We need to experiment at each stage, problem identification, solution identification, implementation, evaluation, with new ways of engaging with people. And they are not the same, and they do not, for the most part, involve the pushing of a button in, ev in, any, in every case or in any case. So with that, I think we have lots more time for discussion. We've cut this short because we have after lunch. You get tons more of me and others. And I will turn it over. Lovely. Thank you, Thank you very much, Beth.